Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to our next episode of Victims of Crime. This one's a little different, but we're joined by Ryan and Brian from Undertaking the Podcast. They're funeral directors and embalmers down in Indiana who know their stuff. And then we have John Hill, who is a mortuary science professor, a funeral director, a trade embalmer, an overall wearer. <laughs> We love him. Pointers tonight, not Carhartt's pointers. Pointers? Is that a word for dogs? Yeah, like like a dog. Yeah, pointers. What? Look at that facial hair, buddy. I tell you, it's a new you. Just just like my hero Ryan, man. Just like my hero Ryan. Go for I need that validation. I appreciate it. So today we're going to talk a little about suicide and I hesitated doing this case and I threw it at the guys and said, Hey, what do you guys think about talking about this? Because it's a little different talking about victims of crime. It's not really a crime, but people we care for that have taken their lives are victims a lot of times of mental health. So they are victims, I think, in a, in an essence from what we talked about. So we decided to talk about the death of Chesley Christ. Um, she just was in the news recently. She's a former beauty queen winner, um, on a national show and, everybody said, oh, she's so beautiful. And she had everything going for her. And she jumped out of her apartment off her apartment balcony and killed herself. And only four, like four to 7% of suicides are from falls. And that was a big question for the guys. Like, have you, you know, we encounter suicide, but how many people have you had jump or accidentally fall as the cause of death? I've had, I've had a few. Um, I probably had seven years I probably had about four four or five so I I would say bigger firms the volume being different probably have have more but I mean yeah I wouldn't say it, it you know you get that phone call I wouldn't say that's something that, that I look at as oh that, that's surprising you know maybe yeah. the person maybe the decedent um but you know as someone jumping and 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 you know, dying by suicide, I, I think that that's not uncommon. Yeah, for me, um, I can't think of a case that has come my way. Now, granted, I live in an area that doesn't have much over two stories. So yeah. you know, there's just not a lot of opportunity around here, uh, frankly, fortunately, but yeah, I can't, can't recall any. Um, where I'm at, I've had two. And um, it's interesting because you know, the way that they looked when everything happened, you could tell that they jumped backwards because it wasn't, it wasn't um, this area that was in bad shape. It was everything from behind. And so when you say this, I was going to say, I mean, you got to remember your, you know, when you say this area, the, the front side, you could tell that it was from the, the way that they jumped they jumped backwards. They didn't jump forward and they landed on their back and they landed in the back of their head. It wasn't the damage and the trauma wasn't extreme in the front. Of course it was there obviously, but nothing of the extreme, like if it was turned around differently, but uh, the other firms I've been to, I haven't had any cases like that. Yeah. Same. We I've not encountered, we just don't have, really, I mean, a bridge jump, but the bridges aren't super high to where I think the impact would kill. It would be more probably drowning after the fact. Um, so yeah, I've just not encountered it, but her case was, I think such a huge, you know, we get that story every once in a while about mental health and it comes back to the forefront and, that she was such a victim of the mental health. She was from Jackson, Michigan, which is right down the road from me, which I thought was crazy that it was kind of, I don't know, things when they come closer to you, it, I don't know, touches base with people more. It's like, oh, they're right down the road. Could have been somebody I knew, could have been whatever. Um, so what do you guys see when you see deaths from falling, I guess? You know, John, you said that there was a lot of impact on the back of that person that they probably just stood and fell backwards, maybe. Or mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. The 
obviously deformity because of the skull being cracked underneath. Um, obviously a lot of lacerations, a lot of open wounds, um, all of that na of nature. And then of course, broken bones, um, a lot of fractures. And, um, and from that, you've got the deformities and things like that that take place because the impact is just doesn't affect the soft tissue. It affects the bones underneath the skeletal frame of the person and which causes a lot of trauma. So that's mainly what I've got on that. Ryan, what have you seen on the one, the people you've cared for? Uh, I, I haven't had necessarily the, the, the backside. It's been more frontal. It's been more, uh, I would say head first, uh, in, in some ways. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's what I've seen. It's not been anything from, from the stand. It, I'll say this. It, it's always been challenging to, for me to, to get these people in their natural acceptable form, the, the, the elements I've had to deal with. So. Do you know how tall the building was or where they leap from? Like how tall was it? Do you know any of that information or can you even Man, say, that? cause I, I'm I, 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 no, 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 I can say that four or five stories, something like that. I mean, it wasn't abnormally high. Cause like I said, we're, the areas we're in, it's not, that's not the case. Um, but I mean, that was, that, that's still a high enough fall. It's absolutely terminal damage. Well, and that's Chesley's jumped from ninth floor of a 60 story building. Um, that's, I can't imagine standing at that, you know, kind of moment and looking down and how far, um, there was a story, so there's a photo. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. It's a super famous photo from back in 1947. Um, this lady, Evelyn, she went up to the 86th floor of the Empire State Building and jumped. And she landed in this car and they took a photo, a photographer took a photo. And it's like a beautiful suicide or something that's called. And she's just laying perfectly. And I would have expected way more trauma visual, but gosh knows what was going on under her because she landed on her back in this car. And I think, I don't know if the impact of the car kind of caught her. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's kind of a well-known photo of suicide, I guess, when you talk about it. So let's talk about, I guess, the major trauma to the body, because that's what we talk about is embalming bodies with these causes of death. So a lot of the bodies have some abdominal trauma, thoracic trauma, some head trauma, majority is extremity fractures that they're hitting with their legs and feet are shooting out the shoes or bones are breaking. So we got fractures coming out of skin and stuff. Talk about some of what we do to treat those kind of traumas on an individual. Well, I think I think we all know, and your listeners probably know, Carrie, that in a situation like this, there's going to be a postmortem examination, so an autopsy. So uh, we're actually going to be able to see things from, uh, the best way to put it, I suppose, is from the inside out sometimes. So we have more of a 360 view of what is going on. I, I suppose there's uh, some... I don't want to say debate, but there are there are two kind of different fields of embalming when it comes to facial reconstruction, and that is there are some that embalm first and preserve tissue before reconstruction, and there are those who uh, reconstruct first and then embalm. So there's, I think the embalmer is going to do what they feel comfortable with and what they're trained on. So again, what well, kind of what Ryan said, you know, we're going to take the best measures that we can to to give someone their loved one back to given that last opportunity to get that natural, uh, acceptable look. No, I don't just, I, I don't know. That, that was a great answer. I don't, I don't know what else to, to say to that. So. What I would say is a lot of the suicides that we have are not autopsied. Um, the ones that, um, you know, fell from falling, they were not autopsied at all. And so the best way that, we would treat that is obviously try to set the bones back as best as possible. And then you use um, formaldehyde gels, you use cauterant gels, things of that nature to stop leakage, to dehydrate, to dry out. Um, 
And then after you do the embalming process with all of that and you try to cauterize everything, then obviously a lot of bandage work, uh, plastics, things like that to make sure there's no leakage involved or to make sure everything is contained. Um, I'm not a big into plastics myself. They're just so baggy. They look so unnatural. So I'm really big into wrapping and you can do plastic wrap, things like that is probably the best method. Yeah. So when you say plastic wrap, you're, you're, you're creating your own bandage basically. Pretty much. Yeah. And it's yeah. not, um, it's, it's more efficient, I think. And it just helps so much more with, with being natural, especially if whatever outfits they're wearing, um, their see-through stuff, sometimes the sleeves, things like that. And it's just a lot better than just having a big old bulky sleeve that you put on. I don't yeah. know if the listeners know what we're talking about when it comes to plastics or anything like that. I'm sure Carrie's got... Well, explain, explain it, John. Well, the plastics are basically um, plastic garments is what they are. And they are used to contain any type of leakage or for a precautionary measure, even though you treat those areas, you just never know. And with certain bodies that have skin slip on them, uh, they are edemas, they have wet blisters, um, cuts and bruises, even though you even sutured those areas and treated all those areas that you need to, sometimes it's a safety measure to where you need to put plastics on underneath their clothing simply because you don't want any wetness or any leakage to come through the clothing. So that's exactly uh, what the plastics are for and what they're needed for. The downside on my end, I believe, is they're just so bulky, but they do serve their purpose. And if you're not careful, if you do put them on too early before a burial or a viewing, they could contain mold and things of that nature, the smell. So um, that's one of the reasons why I don't like the bulky plastics because the bulkiness with air and things of that nature can cause a lot of that. Well, what, what I want to reiterate there is, is that's something that's used all the time. That's something it is. that's used Absolutely. constantly within funeral service. So if, if the general public sees this, that's something that's, that's every day. So exactly. that's, that's not abnormal. There, there's times where, tissue we can't dry out enough we can't we can't put clothing over it because it may still be a little bit wet so you know that's something that i i think that hopefully you know the general public that listens or i say listen i'm sorry i'm on a different platform Our podcaster yeah you know watches this understands that having having plastic garments is not abnormal please don't think that's that's a very much everyday use for a funeral director yeah, and I do have a video where I try all of them on. So you, Wait, I know you did. I knew you can go. You can go check out Carrie trying on all the plastic undergarments. Um, I think you brought up a great point that that you and what you've seen is that the individuals are not autopsied. Where sometimes autopsy really is our best friend when it comes to Absolutely. caring Absolutely. for anybody with trauma. Um, it makes me think. I had a, a gentleman died. He drunk driving and just blew through a stop sign and ran into a tree full speed impact. And just like kind of jumping, um, I was reading about the golden gate bridge. That's like the most well-known, most used suicide jumping place, like in the world. It's insane. There's been like 1200 people that have jumped off the golden gray bridge, but, um, you go from like, you know, 75 miles per hour to zero when you hit that water and it's a solid impact, just like driving a car. And this kid, they didn't do an autopsy. And I wish to God they had, because his skull was just smithereens inside. And if it had been open, it would have been super simple to do more of a reconstruction, put things, I could take his head, go like this. Oh, looks like him. Let go out, you know, like double the size and it was all contained. So it would have been like, okay, can I open your kid's head? Can I do this? Can I do that? And so sometimes it's, it's easier if they're open and you can get to things you're talking about broken bones. That is, we all probably have our ticks, things that we absolutely hate. 
when it comes to dead bodies and broken bones are one of mine. Like when you pick up an arm and the arm like bends here and something sticky creeps me out. It is like <laughs> the top of my list. I can see the goosebumps just rise. And I up can't, and I don't, especially when you got to like push a bone back in the skin and like straighten an arm and or a leg or something. Yeah. Like what do, do you guys get freaked out by that stuff or what do you It makes me cringe, Gary, just like you. Yeah. I think orthopedics in general. I can handle it if I don't see it happen. Oh. You know, like that that's that's the way I was as a medic. If I if I don't see it happen, I can deal with it after the fact, but seeing it happen, hearing the bones break, um sometimes hearing the, you know, trauma that goes with that yeah uh, certain human noises that come from that you know i think that's more traumatic at times than the after effect um for me at least you know that i think the initial blow is is tough um but after the fact i think all of us you know we, we've been in those rooms for hours so I, yeah. you know that's something that i think we're all acclimated to in, in a lot of ways but yeah seeing hearing that that's tough that's tough for me i would have to agree with ryan i can deal with it but seeing it and i'll never forget as a kid i watched uh sid vicious get his oh. leg in the ring i'll never forget that and i was cringing and it still has me cringe to this day <laughs> yeah, any of those but, sports uh, videos where they show and it's like joe theisman breaks his leg and it hits and it like is it, oh my god and you know what's funny and my, that, and my hair standing up <sighs> yeah. do you remember seeing joe theisman's leg break into on national tv i don't i don't know uh, quarterback not, for Notre uh, Dame. nobody nobody understand I, just watch I it Google probably it. watched it's, the video but didn't know who it was because i've seen a whole bunch of those and they're absolutely horrific like it's sickening it's sickening like that, those, that's what I'm talking about. That's where, that's where I'm at. That's what I'm talking about. Like seeing that is tougher than dealing with the aftermath. It really is. Well, and we know they're not feeling anything when we're taking care of them. It's knowing that if they felt something, I think that yeah. maybe it connects to, too. Um, let's talk about handling individuals that die by suicide. What do you guys call it? First of all, took their own life, committed suicide. Died by suicide. Okay. Died by suicide. Brian, you can touch in on this as well. I'll lead it. I'll lead this into you so you can get into this conversation a little bit. Um, I think that, you know, and that was a joke, but nobody laughs. So it doesn't matter. Um, wow. <laughs> Over your guys is, we, we, we did an interview. Uh, ah, it's been probably over, over a year ago with, um, a lady that had a, a loved one, that, you know, died by suicide. Uh, and, and she was talking about the idea of, you know, and, and she kept bringing up, she was talking about the idea of suicide, but she kept bringing up the idea of died by suicide. Myself and Brian had not heard that term before. It's always been committed mm. suicide. And I, I feel like she brought up a good point. She talked about the idea that, you know, suicide is considered a crime, but, you know, when someone's in that mental state, are they committing a, a crime or are they just outside their norm? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it was one of those things where, like, my son didn't commit a crime. He had, he, he had, he had a, uh, a moment of mental lapse. It was not, you know, and, and I, I, I had never thought about that until she had brought it up. Um, you know, and, and to me, it makes sense, you know, and I've talked, we've talked to Dominic Astorino. Um, he's had a, a conversation back and forth uh, with somebody that's listened to his lectures where he has changed a lecture because somebody approached him about what he said about suicide. And it wasn't anything bad. It was just died by or committed. Um, you know, I, I think that that's a very, uh, I think that's a very valid concern and I'm willing to change how I state that because I don't know that that's a crime. If somebody's in that mental, mental state, they need help. I, I don't know that that's a crime by any means. So that's where I, yeah. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I remember those conversations, Ryan. I mean, I, I look at it as if you're on fire, you're going to try to put the fire out. And, you know, that's unfortunately the answer that someone finds at the time for mental, emotional, and even physical pain. So I'm very sympathetic to that as a funeral director. I, I just stick with the word died. Um, I, I try to use clear, plain language as a, as a funeral director, even during pre-need situations when someone's planning ahead, even a very, very young funeral director, I would say when something happens. Now, you're gonna, this will happen when something happens, or you'll call us when something happens. And finally, I had a family look at me and just plainly straight up go, what do you mean when something happens? And I had to kind of kind of take it aback and you know, shift gears. And I said, okay, when they die. And it's like, let's just say that. We're going to stick with that. But so for, for Ryan and I on the podcast, you know, we had a listener that asked us to, you know, use died by suicide. And I'm, okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, that seems to be the accepted terminology these days. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's necessarily to soften, you know, the, the outcome or, or what it may be, but that I don't, I don't necessarily have the reasoning behind it, but that seems to be the accepted terminology and that's what we use. What are you comfortable with, John? Um, well, Ron brought up a good point. I've always just used the term committed suicide and I just been educated just tonight. Um, I've never thought of committing as an act of crime though. Um, and I think that probably the basis, and I could be wrong, but I think the basis of saying someone committed suicide is because it's self-inflicted that they committed that act. But, um, anytime I've dealt with a family, I don't, bring up the word suicide. I don't bring up any, I just say something to the effect of what happened. You know, I say, you know, I'm sorry that this has happened and I'm so sorry that you have to be here. I never use the term suicide and um, I don't necessarily steer away from the term death, but if there's times where when it's suicide, something that sensitive and the family's just, you know, I mean, so unexpected and heartbroken, I just try my best just to say, I'm just so sorry this has happened. I'm so sorry that you're here because of what happened. And I just use, that's that's my go-to when I say suicide. I just use the terms, you know, I'm sorry that this has all happened while we're all here. And uh, that's how I term it for a family. I'm not afraid of the word death. Um, I think that our society has gotten so scared of the term death um, it's not good for our society to be of that mindset, but when it comes to something as tra traumatic as suicide, I think it's, you know, for me, that's how I do it. Well, and I think like it, it is such a sensitive thing. And I've met with families where somebody gets there early, like the immediate person and they say, we're not telling everybody what happened. Exactly. You and I know, but his parents don't need to know even. And they keep it from literally everybody. And they just say it was a car, not a car, like a heart attack. It was this, it was that. And they don't tell literally even the rest of the immediate family. I think some of it is embarrassment. It's trying to process why it's happened. It's, Absolutely. you know, all this guilt, all those feelings that have to come into play. I don't know, because I've never been in that situation. Do you, when you're with an individual and caring for an individual, I find that I am, I, at some point will say, I hope you're at peace, literally out loud to the person because I th look at them and I think, God, what did that moment have to be like for you to be right there at that moment to feel this was the only option for you. And I find that I will always at some point say, I hope you're at peace at, just because I, you know, I hope this is I don't know, like whatever was demoning you was, is pieced out. I'll, pieced I'll out. say, Carrie, that's not abnormal at all. I, you yeah. know, I, I talk to people all the time yeah. and you no, know, I, people can say whatever they want. I don't care first and foremost. Um, but secondly, you know, I talk to my grandmother, um, a pediatric, when, when we're dealing with a pediatric within that preparation room, I have conversations that's that last moment of love in a lot of ways, guys. And I think we have to remember that. Um, for me, that's how I look at it because pediatric calls are tough. You know, there's not a lot of guys within the firm that I'm, you know, affiliated with now that like to deal with that. Um, I'm somebody that doesn't have a problem with it, but it still affects you. You know what I mean? Like I, I I'm, I'm good to be able to do that, but at the same time, 
those moments in that time in that preparation room with that child. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, nobody can't, can't say that you don't bleed a little bit within these calls. Nobody can't say that. Um, there are certain calls that are, are tougher than others, no question about it. But um, yeah, I mean, within pediatric calls, I, I think within that, within that room, you know, I, I talk, I, I, I'll converse, I'll, you know, I, nobody's talking back, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not busting chops there, but I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I truly, I try to make it a revered moment. I try to make it a respectful moment, try to make it a, what I would think for me would be a comfortable moment. So um, for me, that's why I try to do in those situations and, and it helps, but does it go away? Do, do you, you know, we see things, guys, that normal people don't see. So does it go away now? I think you, you always have a mindset. You always remember that one call, uh, no matter what. So when I think it is what it is. with some suicide, you get a bigger picture sometimes because we see them unclothed sometimes and we can see trauma they've inflicted before from cutting or you know we find out about all the abuse that they've done to themselves sometimes up to that moment that is clearly you know mental things that they've been battling through and battling through and battling through up to that point. Do you, can you guys think of a specific suicide case that you have cared for that maybe stuck with you? I mean, I don't want you to share any specifics that would give anything away, but. I'm, I'm going to say this, I'm going to leave it at this. When, when I start taking care of people I graduated high school with that 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 hits you a little different so i'm gonna leave it at that because i'm not gonna go deeper than that but yeah. when you start taking care of people that were that you had memories with that that you know childhood memories with yeah. it it, you're, it just changes things yeah brian how about you i can't think of one specific service that stands out in my mind above all um my mind was kind of going back a little bit uh, because you, you know, you guys were mentioning that you, you know, that you speak to them and whatnot for me, I, I can in a way relate. So, uh, I've had, I've had some rough times, uh, well, not necessarily recently, well, maybe recently, but, uh, my wife and I lost uh, a child, um, second trimester and that kind of threw me in kind of a downward spiral spiral. Um, so yeah, mental anguish and grief can, uh, like, like I explained earlier, can it, it seems like you're on fire from the inside out and uh, you want to put it out. So I can kind of empathize with those that come through our funeral home. And I don't know. I just, I, I, I get it. I get it that, that, and it's, it's scary that I get it, but I, I think now with a little bit of hindsight, uh, you know, I look back over what I did, I made a phone call. So that's what I want to encourage listeners uh, that, that maybe, you know, this is a tough podcast because it's a very real thing that many people go through and they do it in silence. So uh, have someone to call. Don't be ashamed to make that call. And you're probably going to be at a point where you can't even talk. You make that phone call and you're like, I need, I need, in, just give me a second to collect myself. And those, those phone calls are really hard to make, but you'll be glad you did when you do. So and, and it doesn't have to be any certain person because frankly, I called someone completely unrelated uh, to, to me or my situation. It was just someone that I knew that was qualified that could, could help. So that's from that perspective, I get it. It's, it's something so bad. If you haven't, if you can't relate, then be thankful, be very yeah. thankful because it is, it is literally like being on fire and you want to put yourself out. And it's, it's scary when you, when that thought becomes an option, but that's my bet. John. The cases, yeah, the cases that um, I deal with, um, especially when I first started, you know, are jaw dropping, you know, your eyes are raised and don't know how to take it. But if we're not careful as funeral service professionals, we can get a, too accustomed. We're around death so much. We see it so often. Um, and I think of myself 
where I, tr I trade and then I also work at a very high volume mortuary service where you get the calls that funeral homes don't want to have to deal with. And I'll never forget this one young lady that committed suicide and the worker that I was with, her name's Linda. Hey, and, let's change it real quick. Do let's, let's, let's just say died by. Died by. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so she died by suicide and a young lady and Linda looked at her and I'll never forget what she said. She just said, if you just waited one more day, if you just waited one more hour, what could have happened? How this whole thing could have been different. And us as funeral professionals, when we deal with these decedents who have died this way, um, it's good that we talk to them and it's good that we do that because number one, it helps us stay human, mm -hmm. that we're not just going through the motions of another prep or somebody or another case. Number two, there's no doubt in my mind, it helps us continue to treat them with dignity and honor and respect because every funeral professional can go through the motions of death to where, you know, we know that we need to properly take care of them um, just like it was our very own child or our very own loved one. And we've got to do that. It has to be done. And my mindset is always thinking, what a shame, because they have their whole life ahead of them. Um, and it's taken so quick. And that's a very powerful thing to think about. Somebody's life has been taken like that and them dying this way. And just like Brian was saying, what I've experienced and even in my former profession with people with suicide is they just want the pain to go away and they think that there's nothing else. And literally they're not in their total right mindset at all. Not thinking about who it's going to affect, not thinking about the repercussions that's not on their mind at all. They just want the pain to go away. And they unfortunately go to that extreme to where they die by suicide. And it's, um, pretty tragic. So the, the suicides that really, if you want to call it affect me or stayed with me and they don't necessarily stay with me and haunt me at all, but I can vividly remember them. And I just think to myself, you know, if they would have just waited, just like Linda said, what could have changed, what could have happened. Um, as Brian said, make that phone call, just that one phone call, just that one extra moment, that one extra minute, whatever it takes. So I don't know yeah. if I have a question or not, but that's, that's how, Great. Gary? Well said. Very well said. I was going to say when, what that makes me think of that one extra day. I The ones that I think hit me the most is teenagers because we hear or their notes that they leave. It's based sometimes off of there was a girl. I'll never forget. It was a boy didn't dance with her at a dance. She came home and hung herself in her party dress, you know, and it was because of this one moment this one day, this one thing where this is such, I think sometimes middle school and high school can become this all consuming thing where you don't see life after that. And it's just such a blip and the pressure of all of that, that goes on. I, I mean, that is one of my greatest fears. I want to get my kids adulted past all of the bull crap of growing up alive. Like that's literally my goal as a parent, because there's so much that happens that breaks their hearts just at the young age minor at that. I'm like, geez, you know, when you see 10, 11 year olds that kill themselves and do it with thought and do it with planning because they don't see another, any joy or anything beyond. But then we see 90 some year olds who also take their own life because they're just done, you know, and they don't want to deal with the cancer that's come back or they're, they don't want to go through that end stage of whatever it is that's coming. And I think we see such a broad range of types of, you know, causes of death by suicide, whether it's hanging or um, gunshot or, you know, jumping, falling, whatever it is, we see that commitment that some people give and it is there in it. But then there's that also, I think that split second one where it just takes that quick pull of a trigger, that quick step off of the building or whatever it is reading some of the stories from 
the bridge jumpers that have lived and they're like the second my body was in motion i regretted it and thought i can't take it back and they lived through to you know kind of tell those stories and that is wow. those are really powerful to read through because to get that second chance and to under to really cherish life i think at that point i had i think when we were talking about doing this episode i had horrible postpartum depression and kind of like brian said you feel like you just want something to stop mine was almost like i felt like this was happening all the time and i just wanted every time people were talking it felt like this just oversensitized life i was living and i just wanted it to be calm and quiet and sometimes you think that's the only way sometimes to make it stop you know but asking for help and talking to somebody maybe it means medication for a little while maybe it means going to therapy maybe it means you know a vacation and saying i have to be away from my kids for a couple of days or i have to be away from my spouse or whatever like it's okay to do all that it's okay and so but i think working at the funeral home gave me that foresight of okay if i ever chose that i have to then think my family as those families that i'm meeting with and we kind of get that slap almost but i know suit i know funeral directors who have taken their lives and mm. you know it's it's also that other brutal side but yeah so there's our heavy topic for today um if anybody needs help i'm gonna have the number at the bottom of our video the whole time for suicide hotline call them reach out text somebody you can text support to people too you don't have to call and verbally speak if you want to text so get help um because we don't want to see you on our side of things um if you have questions about suicide by jumping or whatever, post those below. Whoa. Dang. All right, John. John it's one of these rooms where it's sensitive lighting and if you don't make motions, it will come on. So let me- Jump around during the serious moment. There, there you there. go. Jeez. I know, I'm sorry about that, guys. You're good. But thank you, we're gonna cut off. Thank you for Ryan and Brian for joining. Thank you, John, as always. If you have any questions, post them below. If you have crimes you want us to talk about moving forward, I know this was a very different version of talking about um, things, but I thought it was good to cover. So thanks, everybody, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye. Bye, Carrie.